Hi guys, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about diabetes. So there's two types of diabetes. We have diabetes type 1 and diabetes type 2. So diabetes type 1, it's an autoimmune condition. So we don't actually know what causes it. Like it can be genetic, it can be um, just the immune system reacting inappropriately to certain triggers like viruses or any other unknown environmental agents that trigger like our immune system, our T-cells to produce cytokines, which then trigger plasma cells to produce antibodies. And these antibodies, they attack our pancreatic cells. Before we discuss the pathophysiology of type 1 diabetes, I want to just explain what happens in a normal pancreatic beta cell, okay? So in a normal pancreatic beta cell, when we have glucose, so for instance, we've just eaten a meal, that glucose they come into the pancreatic beta cell via some glucose transporter and when glucose comes into that cell what they do is they undergo metabolism so they get processed and they get turned into atp so when we have atp inside the um, beta cell what they do is that they um they stimulate those um, potassium sensitive channels they are sensitive to atp so when, when ATP stimulates those potassium channels, what happens is that they close. So they can't let any potassium out of the cell. So what happens is potassium actually builds up inside those beta cells. And when potassium builds up inside those beta cells, obviously we're building a positive charge. We're increasing the voltage inside the cell. And this stimulates those voltage-gated calcium channels. So when these voltage-gated calcium channels are activated, they open and calcium rushes in from the outside of the cell into the beta cell. And this influx of calcium triggers the release of insulin from those vesicles inside their beta cell. In our beta cells, we also have this enzyme called glutamic acid decarboxylase. So glutamic acid decarboxylase converts glutamic acid to GABA. And this GABA, it kind of helps stimulate the production of insulin. So remember those antibodies that I was talking about? So when these antibodies are produced by these plasma cells, they attack specific components of this um, perfect system that we have. So, so we have antibodies that attack um, the actual islet cells. So we have anti-islet cell antibodies. We have anti-glutamic acid decarboxylase antibodies, so they attack the glutamic acid decarboxylase. And we have anti-insulin antibodies, so they attack the insulin directly. So all of these antibodies, what they do is they destroy certain components of this system and they decrease the activity of these beta cells. And if that happens, we decrease the production and the release of insulin, and therefore we increase, increase the blood sugar. Now let's talk about what actually happens when we have insulin produced by the beta cells. So when we have beta cells producing this insulin, this insulin then travels to other cells in the body, and they bind to um, certain receptors on the plasma membrane of our, of our cells, and they um, kind of prompt them to express more glucose transporters on their cell membrane. So they increase the expression of glucose transporters into their cell membrane. And what this does is it um, facilitates the transport of glucose from our bloodstream into those cells. So now you can imagine what happens if we have low insulin because we have antibodies attacking the insulin or antibodies attacking um, the islet cells. So in, in this situation when we have um, low insulin because of, what, what, because of our immune system attacking the insulin or the islet cells, what's going to happen is that we're going to have less um, expression of these glute this glucose transporter so we're not really gonna be able to transport a lot of glucose from the bloodstream into those um, cells so we're we're ending up with a lot of glucose just circulating in the bloodstream and really not much of them be, being taken up by our cells so that's what happens in um, diabetes type 1
Moving on to um, type 2 diabetes. So type 2 diabetes is not an autoimmune problem. It's more like a, a metabolic problem. So typically, patients with type 2 diabetes, they have very high triglycerides, high um, LDLs, low HDL, um, high BMI, and um, typically they have, well, if they have a first degree relative with diabetes, then they are more at risk of developing type 2 diabetes themselves. Um, it's also more prevalent in some um, ethnicities compared to others. So the problem with metabolic syndrome is that this is responsible for insulin resistance, which is the main problem in type 2 diabetes. Insulin resistance simply means that those receptors for insulin, they are not as sensitive to insulin anymore. So even when insulin is around, they don't respond to insulin because they are less sensitive to it, okay? So um, this means that even when insulin is around, they're not increasing the expression of these glucose transporters, and therefore we're not transporting a lot of that glucose into the bloodstream into those cells. So this glucose just builds up in the bloodstream, and eventually, because, of the, because the blood is circulating around the body, they end up in the pancreatic beta cells, and the beta cells go, well, we still have a lot of glucose circulating in the bloodstream. Let's keep pumping out insulin. Let's keep just making and releasing insulin. So this is exactly what they do. They keep pumping out a lot of insulin. And over time, these beta cells, they get worn out. They get very tired just pumping out lots and lots of insulin. So they basically stop doing this. And this decrease in insulin production means that, you know, we're going to be left with a lot of glucose circulating in the bloodstream because less insulin means less expression of those glucose transporters and less transport of glucose from the blood into the cells. Another thing that happens over time, so every time um, these beta cells release insulin from these vesicles inside them, they release a protein called amylin as well. So every time we release um, insulin from those vesicles in the beta cells, we release a protein called amylin. And because we're just pumping out lots and lots and lots of insulin, because there's still lots of glucose circulating in the bloodstream, we're pumping lots and lots and lots of amylin as well. So amylin, over time, builds up. So we get amyloid de deposition in our beta cells. And eventually, these proteins, they destroy our poor beta cells that are just doing their job. So when they destroy beta cells, obviously the activity that uh, decreases. We don't produce as much insulin and we don't take in as much sugar. So we become hyper hyperglycemic. Now let's discuss the clinical manifestations of diabetes. So remember the three Ps. So we have polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. Starting with polyuria, let's explain why this actually happens. Let's think about our kidneys. So the function of our kidneys is to filter out blood, yes? But because we have a very high amount of glucose concentration in the blood, when that gets to the kidneys, they just cannot cope with this crazy amount of sugar. So what happens is some of those sugar, they get filtered out into the tribules. And because there's just so much of them, the kidneys are unable to reabsorb a lot of this glucose. So what ends up happening is we pee out a lot of this glucose. So this is called glucosuria. If we have, glucosuria is just the presence of sugar in, in the urine. So because again, um, the kidneys can't reabsorb a lot of this um, glucose, they end up being peed out into the urine. And the problem with this is um, glucose is highly osmotic. So, um, what this it's it's like osmotically active and what this means is it pulls water with it so where glucose goes water follows so when we pee out a lot of that um, glucose we lose a lot of water with that as well and this means that people with diabetes they pee out a lot of water and this is where that first pee comes from this is where we get polyuria so polyuria is just you know, 
excessive peeing or a high volume of urine being peed out. And this is exactly why it happens because they're losing a lot of glucose in their urine and wherever glucose goes, water follows because glucose is um, osmotically active. It, wherever it goes, it carries water with it. And what this what does this leave us exactly? So what is happening is we're losing a lot of urine. We're, using, we're losing a lot of blood volume. So our blood volume is going down, but the glucose is still elevated because we're not absorbing it in our cells. So what, what this means is we create this kind of low um, blood volume, but high solute concentration, high glucose concentration. So this is a high, we, what we end up having is a hyper um, or smaller blood. This hyper osmolarity that's happening in our blood triggers the osmoreceptors in our, in our hypothalamus. It triggers thirst, okay? And the reason for this is because the brain thinks that, you know, if we trigger thirst, we're going to drink more water and it's going to dilute the blood. So it's going to solve that hyper or smaller problem. But this is where the second P comes into play. Now we have polydipsia, which is excessive thirst. The last clinical manifestation is polyphagia. So because we're not transporting a lot of the glucose into our cells, there's just you know, because we're not expressing a lot of those glucose transporters, glucose cannot be transported from the bloodstream into our cells. So what happens is that we have a decrease in glucose utilization and decrease in production of ATP. And ATP is what our body uses as fuel. So what happens is that our body taps into other potential sources of this fuel. It taps into other potential sources of energy including our fats and including our proteins. So this decrease in glucose utilization kind of triggers the body to look for other sources of energy, including fats and protein, triggering lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fat, and proteolysis, which is the breakdown of proteins. So with lipolysis, specifically, they break down triglycerides into free fatty acids and glycerol. And free fatty acids and glycerol, they feed into a cellular pathway that can generate as ATP, that can generate some, some energy. With proteins, they get broken down into amino acids, and these amino acids, again, they feed into a cellular pathway that generates ATP, um, giving us some energy. So because we're breaking down a lot of fats and a lot of proteins, this can result to weight loss. And because we're losing weight, our body thinks that we're not consuming enough calories. And therefore, it triggers that sensation of hunger. And this is why patients with diabetes have um, polyphagia, which is like that excessive feeling of hunger. Moving on to the diagnosis, we can do many different tests. We can firstly take their fasting um, blood sugar. So we take their blood sugar after fasting for a certain period of time. And if it's greater than or equal to to um, 126 milligrams per deciliter, then that is indicative of um, diabetes. If we just take their blood glucose, just random the blood glucose test, if it's more than or equal to 200 milligrams per deciliter, again, that's indicative of diabetes. We can just do um, a glucose tolerance test as well, or we can measure their hemoglobin A1c. And if the hemoglobin A1c is greater than or equal to 6.5%, that is again indicative of diabetes. So just really quickly, hemoglobin A1c. So we have, if we have lots and lots of glucose in our bloodstream, some of them, they conjugate with hemoglobin, forming this conjugated product we call hemoglobin A1c. And we can actually measure this. So this can aid um, us with a diagnosis of diabetes. Now let's talk about some of the chronic complications of diabetes. So if we have such a high glucose concentration in the blood, some of this glucose will conjugate with um, lipids and with proteins. And in a process called non-enzymatic glycation, so they, they um, conjugate with lipids and with proteins without any enzymes called non-enzymatic glycation. And they produce like highly inflammatory molecules. 
And um, these molecules, what they do is they make the vessels inflamed. So they um, like promote inflammation within their vessels, promoting um, LDL deposition in the vessels, leading to atherosclerosis. And when we have atherosclerosis, we have that plaque and it limits like the blood flow um, through that vessel, which may lead to CAD if this happens in the coronary arteries, potentially leading to um, myocardial infarction if that ischemia isn't reversed in time. If this um, atherosclerotic plaque happens in our peripheries, we can have like peripheral arterial disease, PAD, leading to um, diminished pulses, cold extremities, eventually gangrene and ulceration as that extremity is not receiving enough blood supply. If this happens in the brain, then we can get um, ischemic strokes because we occlude those um, blood vessels in the brain and a part of the brain won't receive um, enough oxygen, causing an ischemic stroke. What else? Um, this can also happen in a, ret in a retina. So there's three specific findings we need to be aware of um, when we're examining for like diabetic retinopathy. The way we examine for this is we use um, an, an ophthalmoscope. We look into the retina, the back of the eye, and we should see um, like microaneurysms, cotton wool spots, and flame hemorrhages. These potent inflammatory um, molecules created by the conjugation of glucose and lipids or glucose and proteins, they can also cause like haline arteriosclerosis. This happens um, this can happen in our kidneys. So when this happens in our kidneys, they can this the, this um, proteinaceous deposits they can damage our glomeruli, and when they damage our glomeruli, this can increase the filtration of protein, meaning that we can leak out a lot of the protein into our urine, and this is not normal. So um, most specifically, we're going to leak out a lot of albumin. So we're going to see microalbuminuria. And over time, this may even cause chronic kidney disease. High glucose can also be converted to sorbitol. And in some cells, this sorbitol can be converted to fructose via an enzyme called sorbitol dehydrogenase. Um, the thing is, in some cells, we don't have this enzyme called sorbitol dehydrogenase. So sorbitol, so glucose just convert gets converted to sorbitol and it ends there. It doesn't get converted to fructose. And the problem with sorbitol, it's it's very extremely osmotically active. So it pulls a lot of water wherever sorbitol is. And that can cause um, damage to the cell. That can cause um, a smaller death of the cell. It's gonna like the cell can lice and rupture because of a lot of fluid that's accumulating in that cell. So some of the cells or tissues where we don't have sorbitol dehydrogenase include like the lens of the eye. So in, in the lens of the eye, we don't have this enzyme. So if this happens in the lens of the eye, then we can get um, cataracts. If this happens in um in the tubules, the tubular cells, they don't have it too. So the tubular cells in our kidneys, if this happens, then it's going to contribute towards that nephropathy. Um, another one is Schwann cells. So in Schwann cells, if this happens, it may lead to the demyelination of these neural cells. And if this is a somatic cell supplying like the distal extremities, because of that demyelination, that destruction of the myelin sheath that surrounds that cell, what may happen is that the diabetic person may lose sensation in the distal extremities and may even feel some burning or like tingling sensation. And this causes that sensory deficit that we see in diabetics, which is really sad because this means that, for instance, they hit their toe and they got wounded, they won't even realize that they hurt themselves because of that sensory deficit, because of this destruction of those myelin sheath and this, that demyelination of the Schwann cells. And um, also because of their high glucose concentration in the blood, this affects their wound healing process. So it's not just they, they're not aware that they've hurt themselves, their healing process would also be 
impaired because of that high glucose concentration in their blood. Let's quickly talk about the treatment. I'm not gonna go into the pharmacology or the mechanism of action of all of these drugs. I'll try to do that in a separate video because there's just a lot of drugs um, and I want to keep this video really brief. So for type 1 diabetes, because they are insulin dependent, we give them insulin. That's easy. <laughs> type 2 diabetes, we have a lot more options because there's a lot more going on. Um, the first line is metformin. Just remember that, it's most important, metformin. The other options we have, we can use um, like DPP-4 inhibitor. So as I was saying, I don't know why the video just stopped itself. <laughs> the first line is metformin. And the other options we have, we can have GLP-1 agonist, we can have um, DPP-4 inhibitors, we can have SGLT2 inhibitors, we can have um, sulfonyl ureas, we can have um, glucosidase inhibitors, and also insulin. Also, we need to be able to address and treat some of the um, complications, so the chronic complications of diabetes. So starting with um, neuropathy. So we can give them something like gabapentin for their neuropathic pain. And very importantly, we need to be able to um, like get them or get a podiatry to visit them at least once every year so they can get their feet checked for any, you know, ulcerations, gangrene, just for like, like general um, foot health and maybe like proper shoe fitting. Um, just things they can do to look after their feet. The next one is nephropathy. So we can give them ACE inhibitors or ARBs. We can give them, um, we can measure, oh, it's really important for us to monitor their kidney function at least like yearly. And we can do this by measuring their creatinine levels, their BUN levels, or even their microalbumin levels. The third one is retinopathy. So we can give them um, VEGF inhibitors. And most importantly, we need to get them to visit an optometrist at least once a year, just to check their eyes, um, their lens for any cataracts, to check, to check their retina for those three signs of diabetic retinopathy. So um, like microaneurysms, cotton wool spots, and flame hemorrhages. The last one is atherosclerosis. So we give them aspirin. And we check their lipid panels, so we check their triglyceride levels, HDL, LDL levels. Um, and we give them statins if their risks are um, high for developing atherosclerosis. 